Welcome. Let's talk today about what I have called scriptural apologetics. So first, uh, let me take a moment to define scriptural apologetics. Every scripture existing in biblical text has a right context for interpretation and its meaning. And uh, to be able to defend or give a reputable explanation for any biblical text, one must discover, uncover, and gain uh, comprehension of that context. And once that context has been established, now there are fixed and reliable parameters uh, in place so that one can then rightly exegete uh, and interpret uh, the text before contextualizing that text into a formidable and effective apologetics. So here is the conclusive statement surrounding that process that I, that I just described. One must have parameters for what one would defend. So having right context establishes necessary parameters, or boundaries, if you will, uh, for scriptural apologetics. If one desires or believes themselves to be called and compelled to defend the transformative theological or moral and ethical doctrines of biblical exposition, there must be some fixed parameters. And then with those parameters, we now know what we are defending and how to defend it. So let me share, let me share some of those uh, parameters today. For scriptural apologetics, one must first begin with a personal commitment to, to gain understanding and to maintain a fidelity to the original author's intended meaning. Secondly, one would then need to utilize a reliable process for interpreting and defending the ancient text of Scripture or to competently represent the biblical worldview on theological topics such as creation or the existence of evil, uh, good versus evil, the existence of God, uh, the existence of Jesus, the deity of Christ, the death and the resurrection of Christ, sin, eternal salvation, heaven, and hell, etc. I think you get the point. Thirdly, to more accurately form an apologetics for weighty uh, moral and controversial topics in biblical theology, so, such as the ones that uh, we just mentioned, one's apologetic process must include uh, a sound inductive, and by inductive I mean evidential and objective, a sound inductive interpretation of those scriptures uh, addressing the laws, the covenants, the commands, the principles, precepts, expectations, and all of the theology and doctrine that, that comes along with them. To inductively interpret any text or, or scripture, one must come to understand the context for the text of the author of origin, biblical context, historical context, language, linguistic, all, all of the above. The inductive conclusions that are the result of a right and rigorous process are the conclusions that will stand strong, and they are unmovable against the deductive conclusions and secular reasoning that's often used by non-believing and faithless opposition. Finally, one must be able to grasp and embrace the original intent and meaning of the author to accurately recontextualize the biblical text back into the relevancy of present-day apologetics and a, a worldview debate. There is, no, there is no right way to defend or represent scripture, its theology and doctrines, and the biblical worldview without some sincere attempt at accomplishment of this type of uh, what we call hermeneutical process, or one similar to it. And these are just a few of the essential parameters for finding and utilizing right context for scriptural apologetics. So today, uh, I want to do something uh, interesting. Uh, interesting to me. I hope I hope it is to you. What I'd like to do is I'd like to uh, I'd like to build a quick scriptural apologetics 
for the passage in Scripture, Acts 16, 30, and 31. And you'll probably recognize uh, this passage as the one that was selected uh, for this week's written assignment uh, in our class. So I'm going to provide for you a roadmap for an apologetic response as if one were posing a curious or contending question, contending questions from a position of unbelief. So that contending point of position and perspective would be this one here. Christianity says, I'm a sinner and must be saved. Why do I need to be saved? And if so, what do I need to do to be saved? So again, that point of position and perspective would be from a contending point. Christianity says, I'm a sinner, I'm a sinner and must be saved. Why do I need to be saved? And if so, what do I need to do to be saved? The counterpoint of position and perspective um, I'll present right now. In my response, I would say, these are two very good questions. To answer those questions, let me give you another perspective from the biblical position of Christianity. It is the Bible, actually, that says we all need to be saved. We need to be saved because we're sinners, and sin has its consequences. Listen to what the Bible has to say about sin in Romans 6.23. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God uh, is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. You see, our sin is a big problem. It affects all. Actually, the Bible tells us in Romans 3.23 that there is no distinction that all of us, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And therein we find the answer as to why all of us need to be saved. We're sinners. We're sinners, all of us. However, none of us are without hope in dealing with the problem of our sin. And why is that so? It's so because the Bible informs us in Romans 5 and verse 8 but God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So what we see is that God has a plan in place for our sin. His plan is salvation. It's salvation obtained through his son Jesus Christ. And here then are the steps for salvation. First, first step, we own our sin. As we said, we're sinners and are instructed to not only confess our sin, but to acknowledge it. And when we do, God will forgive us and we have begun the necessary steps to being saved. Listen to what 1 John chapter 1, verses 8 and 9 says. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and he is just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So God's plan for salvation is forgiveness of our sin and then the transformation of our lives. Taking these steps is not at all improbable or impossible for anyone. It is all entirely possible for everyone. Romans chapter 10 verses 12 and 13 says, for there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So then, once we have confessed our sin, we just take the next step. We believe. The Bible is also very clear about establishing belief in Christ. Listen to the words of Jesus from John 3, 16 and 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world through him might be saved. 
So then the final steps regarding believing in salvation are very concise and specific to believing in Jesus as our source of salvation. Jesus himself said in John chapter 6 verse 47, Truly I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. So those necessary steps to being saved are clear, they're accessible, and they're entirely possible. And here is what taking those steps of faith accomplish. Romans chapter 10 verses 8 through 10 lays it all out for us. But what does scripture say? The word is near you. It's in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. So now I'd like to say, or now I'd like to share, uh, or say to you, uh, that we can make uh, some illustrations to, pre to present our, uh, our counterpoint and our perspective. We call this an inductive or an evidential illustration. So, to give illustration for the question, what must I do to be saved, there are, as we know, hundreds of biblical examples illustrating not only the need that we have for salvation, but also the steps and experiences of people who believed in Christ of the Bible and came to be saved as evidenced by the transformation uh, of their lives. One of the best inductive biblical illustrations of a life transformation is found in Acts 16 verses 30 through 31. Now this illustration is from a true story that took place in a city called Philippi which is now in what we know as modern-day Greece. But back then, it was in what was known as the region uh, of Macedonia and was considered a leading city, or a small Rome as it was often referred to. So with the support of a local uh, businesswoman, the Apostle Paul, a Christian missionary, and his friend Silas had traveled a great distance to, to Philippi to inform and influence the people uh, in that city, they wanted to influence and inform them of a life-changing Christian faith and a belief in Christ. Now, they came and they shared, they taught, they preached, and they had good response with the people and experienced many, many of those people being saved and their lives being transformed. Now, of course, this angered some of the city leaders who stood to lose profit because they had trafficked many slaves and those slaves were now coming to Christianity. So to dissuade the momentum and further conversions, Paul and Silas were beaten, arrested, and then they were jailed. Listen to what the scripture and the story of Paul and Silas, uh, listen to what took place from the point uh, that they were arrested. It's found in Acts 16, verses 25 through 34. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly there was a great earth, or an earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's bonds were unfastened. Now when the jailer woke, and saw that the prison doors were open. He drew out his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried out to him with a loud voice, Do not harm yourself, for we're all here. And the jailer called for lights and rushed in, and then trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. And then he brought them out and said, He said to them, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they responded and said, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. And he took them 
the same hour of the night, and washed their wounds. And he himself was baptized at once, and all of his family. And then he brought them up into his house and set food before them. And he rejoiced along with his entire household that he had believed in God and was saved. So from this story in Acts 16, we can make some very, uh, some very clear conclusions. There is concise and conclusive biblical evidence for why any of us needs to be saved and how we can miraculously change our lives and become Christians. First, we know that we have to acknowledge our sin to ourselves. Next, we need to take a step of faith towards God. And then, we need to confess our sin to Him. We follow that with belief in God, who transforms and redeems people's lives for good and not for evil. The next step would be that we would receive the gift of eternal life in the resurrected Christ Jesus. And those are the steps. Now, as to why the Bible says we must be saved, and that God wants us to repent of our sin and believe in Him, here are some conclusive answers, and we find them in the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, verse 6. And without faith it is impossible to please God. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that He exists, and that He rewards those who seek Him. Also in Acts, chapter 4, verse 12, and there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. So getting to the point of faith is a short journey for some and a long journey for others. Nonetheless, we need to know that faith is a journey. More importantly, it is a journey that must be made in order for us to be, or any individual, to be saved and for one then to believe in God. And the rest, the rest becomes fairly simple. God created us, God loves us, He does not want us to ruin our lives uh, or spend an eternity separated from Him. So let me tell you why this is the only reasonable and logical conclusion and evidence. I do that by going to Genesis chapter 1 verse 26. Then God said, Let us make men in our image and after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. Now this is supported by the most famous, well-known, and single most quoted verse of the Bible, John 3.16, which we already referred to earlier. For God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him will not perish, but have everlasting life. The evidences, then, are clear. Yes, the Bible says we are sinners and must be saved. Yes, He has made a way for you to be saved, Jesus. And yes, it is only by grace through faith that we're saved. And our final word on this comes from Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. I'll read that and we'll be concluded. And you were dead in the trespasses and sin in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived, in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with Him, and seated us with Him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages He might show the immeasurable riches of His grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace 
you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one could boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Thank you for your time today. I look forward to seeing you in our classroom forum. Uh, God bless you all.